Okay. okay, so good afternoon to everybody and welcome back for this uh, second day of the IFT Christmas workshop. The first talk of today's session is devoted to neutrino physics and it's a pleasure to welcome Thomas Schwetz from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, who is a world expert on this topic. Thomas is group leader in theoretical astroparticle physics at his institute and is one of the founding members of the NUFIT collaboration. He is known worldwide for his global fits to neutrino properties, which link together theoretical models with experimental data. So today he will tell us about uh, what's going on in neutrino physics and what we can expect for the coming years. Thank you, Thomas. Okay, thank you, Michele, and thank you for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to, to give this talk here. Of course, I would have preferred to be in person in Madrid and uh, give the talk, but okay, I'm happy to do it that way. So uh, I will talk about uh, recent developments in neutrinos and actually Yesterday, we had some very interesting talks about uh, some hints about new physics, like the Hubble tension or the xenon hint. And so today, I will talk about some hints we have in neutrino physics, uh, or we had in neutrino physics, and discuss what happened to them uh, recently. So let me start with uh, pointing out what you all know very well. So neutrino oscillate and we have uh, beautiful evidence for neutrino oscillations. I show here a few examples. So we have now lots of experiments uh, confirming with high significance that uh, neutrino oscillations happen. And uh, this implies that neutrino have to have mass. And of course, as you know very well, this was also recognized uh, by the Nobel Committee a few years ago. Now, uh, as you all also know very well, in the standard model, neutrinos are massless for, for those reasons here. First of all, because uh, there are no right-handed neutrinos in the standard model and uh, lepton number is an accidental symmetry. And so at the renormalizable level, it's, it's not possible to write down uh, a Majorana mass term for neutrinos. And so this means that uh, neutrino mass implies physics beyond the standard model. Uh, so of course the question is what is the origin of neutrino mass and uh, one can take the approach of uh, effective uh, theory. This is the uh, famous observation made by Weinberg many, many years ago that, that uh, if you go uh, beyond every normalizable level, namely at dimension five, already lepton number is no longer uh, accidental symmetry and then at dimension five you can write down an operator which breaks lepton number and this is the famous Weinberg operator which gives rise to a Majorana mass term uh, after electroweak symmetry breaking and the unique uh, prediction of this approach is that lepton number is violated. Now this approach doesn't tell us anything more uh, in particular we don't know what is the physics responsible for that operator, what is the uh, relevant uh, uh, physics generating neutrino mass. And moreover, even we don't know, it doesn't make any prediction about the energy scale for that new physics. Because, I mean, we can make neutrino mass small by either by making this scale of new physics very large or by making the, the corresponding coupling constants but very small or some combination of the two. And so, I mean, I've shown here in this uh, diagram a huge range of possible scales of new physics spanning many, many orders of magnitude and essentially from the pure observation of neutrino mass, we have no clue actually at which scale we should search for this new physics responsible for the neutrino. So for the rest of this talk, I will therefore take a completely phenomenological approach. And so this is the, the outline of the, of the talk. I will uh, discuss what we know about the low energy uh, model, or let's say the low energy description 
of the neutrino sector, namely the determination of the three flavor oscillation parameters. And uh, I mentioned that I will discuss some hints, and in particular, I will discuss uh, possible hints for CP violation and the type of the neutrino mass ordering, which have been there for, uh, for some time. And what is the fate of them with recent developments? Then I will briefly re review the absolute neutrino mass measurements and the search for lepton number violation. And then in the, towards the end of the talk, I will discuss possible hints for exotic neutrino properties. And I will briefly mention non-standard neutrino interactions and sterile neutrinos. So let me start with three flavor phenomenology. So the, the low energy physics of the three flavors in the standard model can be described by those nine parameters, three masses, three mixing angle, and, and three phases. And uh, in the beginning of my talk, I will focus on the blue, on the parameters shown in blue here. These are uh, six parameters, which we can address by neutrino oscillations, two mass square differences, the three mixing angle, and one complex phase, the so-called uh, Dirac phase. Those are the parameters accessible to neutrino oscillations. And I will start discussing uh, the status of them in the beginning. This is the standard uh, parametrization we adopt for, for, for this, uh, these parameters, the, the mixing matrix is factorized in, in three rotations. And by convention, the complex phase is put here in the, in the one three sector, which is the middle uh, of those rotations. And as a matter of fact, there are some hierarchies. There are some small numbers here. And for that reason, three flavor effects are suppressed, namely by the hierarchy of the two mass splittings. So there is a factor, roughly a factor 30 between the two mass differences. And one of the mixing angles is small, theta 1, 3 is small. And so general three flavor effects are suppressed by those small numbers. And the dominant oscillation modes are well described by effective two flavor oscillations. Now, as I will show you with present data, we are already sensitive to the subleading effects and we start seeing uh, really genuine three flavor effects. And this is the, the, the stuff I will mostly discuss uh, in the following. So here is the rough picture. Uh, it's, it's shown in this, uh, in this diagram here. What I show is that the mass states, the neutrino mass states, which can be arranged in these two different ways. We have the two mass splittings, the small one and the large one, roughly a factor 30. And the color code indicates how the, the flavor states are distributed over the mass states. And uh, um, surprisingly, what we see is that uh, the, the mixing is large. I mean, surprising in the sense that mixing in the quark sector is very different. In the quark sector, mixing is small. And here in the lepton sector, mixing is large. And we have mixing angles here of the order of uh, nine degrees or large mixing angles. And uh, OK, here are the, these two possibilities of the, how we can arrange the, the masses. This is called normal ordering and inverted ordering. And I will spend some time discussing the status. Present data is consistent with those uh, both possibilities. Now, uh, in this table, I show uh, various experiments which are sensitive to those, those parameters. We have for each parameter some set of experiments uh, uh, different of different types. But you, what, what, what we, we see here that actually there is lots of synergy between different experiments and we have here overlap between complementary measurements. And so uh, the, the optimal tool to extract the maximum of information on those parameters is to have a combined analysis of all those uh, global data. And this is especially true for the subleading effect. So since we are interested in here of the, these uh, three flavor effects, and th those are manifest themselves essentially by the combination 
of different experiments. And um, I'm working in this new fit collaboration together with uh, Concha Gonzalez Garcia and Michele Martoni. We are maintaining this new fit uh, collaboration. And I will report now on our latest paper, which you have the reference here, which we wrote together with, uh, with some, some students. Now, let me also mention that uh, I will present the results of our analysis, but there are also other groups performing similar global fits and uh, like the, the Bari group or the Valencia group. And in general, our results are compatible uh, once, the, once we consider this the same data set. So let me show you the results of our analysis. So here, I, I have a big table which gives you the, uh, the, the present status of the, the six parameters relevant for neutrino oscillations. So of course you are not going to read this table now. So whenever you need those numbers, you can go to our website and look up all those numbers. So let me give you the, the, main, the main results here. So we have some parameters which are very robustly determined by the global data. So those are those four parameters here, the mixing angle one, two and one, three. Uh, and it's and the and the size of the mass square differences, and in those parameters the chi square is is just a parabola, so it's a very Gaussian behavior. We have an excellent determination, and uh, the 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 chi square is Gaussian up to very high confidence level, and we have a relative precision at three sigma, which is at the level of uh, ten percent. We are slightly below 10% for those parameters, slightly above 10%. So here we are really doing, uh, starting the, the precision error of neutrino physics in those, those parameters. The third mixing angle theta 2, 3 situation is, is still somewhat ambiguous. There the, the three sigma precision is uh, close to 30%. And here we have this non-Gaussian behavior. There is this degeneracy in the data. We, we cannot distinguish the octant of theta 2, 3. And there is uh, still some ambiguity going on here. Now, for the, I will concentrate now on, on these open questions here. There is the ambiguity of the mass ordering, or we use the sign of the, the larger delta m squared to parameterize is uh, the type of the mass ordering, normal versus inverted, and the, the value of the CP phase. So let me focus in the following on, on those two questions. Now, uh, actually the status about one year ago was, we, we have been seeing some preference for the normal mass ordering at the level of three sigma by some subtle interplay of the global data. And there were some hints that CP violation could be large, somewhere at the level between two and three sigma were the significance of those hints, which was mostly driven by the comparison of T2K with the dial bay measurement. And actually this made it even to the cover of the Nature Journal. Now I'm going to discuss, there has been some new data earlier this year at the Neutrino 2020 conference in the June, June this year, and uh, most importantly, from T2K and NOVA accelerator uh, experiments, there was new data. And I will discuss now the status of those hints in the light of those uh, new data which appeared uh, earlier this year. So, um, as I mentioned, with respect to the mass ordering and CP violation, the, the, the most relevant data came from T2K and NOVA. These are accelerator experiments uh, in Japan using an uh, accelerator facility here at, at JPAR and uh, with a baseline of about 300 kilometer, the super Kamikande detector to detect neutrinos. And in NOVAR, neutrinos are produced at Fermilab and measured uh, here close to the border to Canada at the, at the NOVA detector. And uh, those experiments start with a muon beam and they can observe the muon disappearance channel and the uh, muon to electron appearance channel. So we have those two uh, channels here. 
And uh, let me start with the appearance search. So this is the uh, uh, transition probability from muon neutrinos to electron neutrinos. Um, this can be described by this uh, formula here. Uh, it involves uh, uh, essentially all of the neutrino parameters. And so there is the theta one three, which controls the amplitude. This is essentially fixed by the reactor measurements. So these prefactors are fixed. And uh, then we have here those, uh, uh, those terms. And in particular here is the interference term, which is suppressed by the small parameters, which I mentioned, theta one three, and the small uh, mass splitting, which is also sensitive to, to the CP phase. And uh, actually this uh, simple formula allows, uh, 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 well, allows us to discuss essentially the most important features which you are seeing in those data. What is shown here, we can use this formula essentially to predict the number of events in this appearance channel. And those red and blue bands show, show the behavior of, of the number of events as a function of the CP phase. So we are seeing essentially this cosine term here. We are seeing also the manifestation of CP violation. So this is antineutrinos, this is neutrinos. And so the fact, the fact that those curves have the opposite shape uh, is a manifestation of, of CP violation. And so this is the uh, prediction for T2K. Here we have the corresponding NOVA. So what we are also seeing here, the red and the blue correspond to the two orderings, normal and inverted. And the fact that the, the bands are more separated for NOVA than for T2K is a manifestation of the matter effect. So this is parameterized by this parameter A here. And since for NOVA, the baseline is longer, we have about 800 kilometers versus 300 for T2K. The, the effect of matter, the matter effect is stronger. And so the, these two bands are much more separated for NOVA than they are for T2K. Um, now, what is also shown here in gray is the observed number of events. And so now if we com compare the prediction with the observed number of events within the one sigma band here, uh, we can understand uh, what's, what's going on. So I show here the, the chi-square behavior for, for various experiments as a function of the CP phase. And what we are, what we are seeing here is actually that T2K uh, prefers uh, region here uh, by 3 pi over 2, where T2K predictions are in better agreement with, with the observations for neutrinos and for antineutrinos. And this we are seeing here with the red curve. If you look at the red curve, we are seeing here this behavior for T2K with a preference here around 270 degrees and the same thing uh, for normal and for inverted ordering. Now the situation is somewhat different if we compare it with the, with the, with the case of NOVA. So now we are seeing actually that for normal ordering, NOVA seems to prefer actually the opposite range for, for the CP phase. This, this is here shown by this uh, kind of purple curve that for NOVA, there is a preference in this region around 90 degrees for the speakers, whereas this part here is slightly disfavored. Whereas for the inverted ordering, which is the blue band here, NOVA and T2K prefer the same region. So this is the effect that T2K and NOVA with the recent data actually have a, have a preference for the inverted ordering. So they fit better for the inverted ordering which is the, the blue curve here, they're seeing a, a slight preference from, from long baseline data for the inverted ordering compared to the normal, normal ordering. Now, what concerns this affects, of course, also this, the measurement of the CP phase. So if we, if we, because of this, some of this, this tension here in normal ordering, we are seeing here 
that the combination is pushed towards uh, 180 degrees. So the, the, the combined, if you're looking now at the blue curve, which is the combination here, actually it has a, a, pre, a preferred best three point clo very close to 180, which corresponds to CP conservation. So in this case, for normal ordering, there is actually no indication for CP violation. So uh, this shifts, so this is what I just said, it shifts the, the allowed range for the CP phase very close to CP conservation. Only in inverted ordering, we are seeing some preference for CP violation. So now let's, let's, let's come to the status of the mass ordering. So, and for this reason, we should also consider the disappearance channel. As I mentioned, the long baseline experiments can measure also uh, muon disappearance. I have here uh, the, the corresponding data sets for T2K and NOVAR, and we're seeing really a relative, so here we have for the hundreds of events, so we can do actually a relatively precise measurement of the spectrum. And we are seeing here really beautifully the, the oscillation pattern. And uh, as, a, as a function of energy, we are really seeing oscillatory behavior. And this gives a very good determination of the mass splitting. You know, the mass splitting controls the frequency of this uh, oscillatory pattern. And this gives an excellent determination of the delta M square. Now, the same is true. We have also information from electron disappearance. Now, this is done at reactor experiments. Reactor can measure the disappearance of electron neutrinos. I show here the most precise measurement from Dia Bay. Similar, they have excellent uh, high statistics measurement of the spectrum, and we can really map out the oscillation pattern and get a very precise determination of their time square. Now, these, the results of those data are shown in this plot. What I show here is the determination of delta M square as a function of mixing angle. And we are seeing here the muon disappearance data, which measures the, the delta M square as a function of theta 2, 3. And uh, here is the electron disappearance from the reactor experiments, which measures the same delta M square, but the amplitude is controlled by a different mixing angle by theta one three. And actually we see that the, the determination of the mass splitting is uh, very good, very good agreement. So this is a very non-trivial consistency check of the three flavor paradigm. You know, we have very different measurements, completely different experiments, a different channel, muon electron, muon disappearance versus electron disappearance. And the fact that those two measurements agree within errors is a not very non-trivial consistency check. And I think this is a very beautiful uh, success of the three flavor paradigm to find within errors and within comparable accuracy that those measurements agree. Now, as a matter of fact, we can now use this so the upper panels here correspond to normal ordering and the, the lower panel correspond to inverted ordering and actually this measurement is now precise enough that we are seeing subleading effects now it turns out that muon and electron disappearance measure slightly uh, different combinations so they are sensitive to some effective mass splitting called here delta m square mu mu and delta m square ee. E. And the difference is a, a small effect. You know, this is the, the small delta m square. This is the delta m square uh, 2, 1, which is a factor 30 smaller than those. And so there, there is here the difference between those effective measurements. And this correction term de depends on the mass ordering. So the different signs here correspond to normal and inverted ordering. And actually, if you look very closely to those measurements, it turns out that those measurements agree better for normal ordering than for inverted ordering. So we can use these subtle three flavor effects. Uh, this gives us a sensitivity to the mass ordering actually by comparing those two measurements. Now, this is illustrated here in, in this plot. 
So this shows now the projected chi-square. So sorry, this is a very, very busy plot, but you should focus on the comparison of the blue and the black curve. The blue curve is the long baseline, muon disappearance, and the black curve is the reactor experiments. And you, you see that for, for normal ordering, the, the blue and the black curve agree better than for inverted ordering, where the, the, they are somewhat off. And um, so uh, as a matter of fact, reactor and long baseline experiments are in better agreement for normal ordering than for inverted ordering. And so we have now these, these different tendencies that, as I mentioned before, the long baseline experiments by themselves prefer actually inverted ordering. So the best fit for the blue curve is here for the inverted ordering. But when we combine it with the reactor experiments, the long baseline reactor combination prefers normal ordering. And so we have here these different tendencies in the data and well, it turns out if you combine them that the, the comp reactor long baseline complementarity is slightly stronger. And so the overall preference is again for normal ordering with a delta chi-square of, of about uh, 2.7, <coughs> which is essentially, essentially not significant. This is below two sigma effect. <coughs> and so essentially there is no uh, significant statement we can make here. Actually, this was uh, it, before the, the latest update, the difference was six units in chi-square, which was above two sigma. So we are seeing here that with this new data, essentially the, um, um, uh, this hint for normal ordering decreased, decreased significantly and now uh, it basically disappeared. Okay, so there is one more uh, type of uh, uh, data or some data set sensitive to the mass ordering, which is atmospheric neutrinos. In principle, uh, atmospheric neutrino is sensitive to the matter effect. And uh, if we were able to observe these patterns uh, in, in neutrinos or antineutrinos, we would be, I mean, what we should see is the resonance effect and whether the resonance happens in neutrinos or antineutrinos would allow us to distinguish uh, between the orderings and atmospheric data has some sensitivity to, to this effect. Um, now, uh, unfortunately, in, in, uh, uh, when you fold in all the experimental effects like energy smearing and reconstruction direction smearing. Uh, and uh, most importantly, super Kamikande cannot distinguish neutrino and anti-neutrino events on an on a event per event basis. This effect is highly diluted and it remains really a very tiny subtle effect, which is shown here in these slides as the difference between the, the blue and the orange dashed uh, histograms. And this is really a tiny effect. And Super Kamikande reports here a preference for normal ordering of about four units in chi-square. Now, the problem is we, unfortunately, we cannot reproduce this effect outside the Super Kamikande collaboration uh, because we have not access to all the efficiencies and the experimental uh, cuts which are necessary to perform this analysis. And so we kind of have to take this as a black box and add this result to, to our global analysis. Now, if we do this, we slightly increase the hint for normal ordering because if we, uh, if we add this uh, super Kamikande data, we, we, we get about seven units in chi-square uh, preference for normal ordering. So this, this hint, which appeared before, is now slightly stronger, about uh, seven units. Also, this decreased significantly before the latest update. You know, before the latest update, there was 10 units in chi-square, which was above three sigma. It's now clearly below three sigma, and this effect has been diluted now because of these long baseline uh, results. Now, I should also mention that only some uh, slightly old 
data set is available. So this, this data which we can use, this chi square table was presented for, for a data set uh, which is now three years old. And there has been also an update presented at the Neutrino conference from, from Super K. And apparently the, the significance is, is going down with this updated analysis. Actually, uh, they, what, what, what is stated here is actually an improved analysis, improved in the sense that they had better cuts, which should actually enhance their sensitivity to those uh, uh, three flavor effects also the statistics increased a bit. And so the fact that if you have increased statistics and improved analysis and the, the significance goes down is maybe slightly worrisome. And so it seems that also this uh, hint coming from atmospheric neutrinos is maybe not uh, really robust. And uh, well, unfortunately the corresponding chi square table is not available yet. So we, we cannot yet use this latest update in, in our global analysis. Okay, this is uh, the status of CP violation and uh, mass ordering. So let me now briefly come to uh, absolute neutrino mass measurements. There are basically three ways to uh, constrain absolute neutrino mass. Uh, this is cosmology, beta decay experiments, and uh, neutrinoless double beta decay. And I want to comment uh, briefly on those three methods. Uh, let me start with cosmology. Now, finite neutrino mass affects the growth of structure in the universe. And therefore, CMB and large scale structure observables are sensitive to the, to the mass of neutrinos. So, uh, well, I have not the time to discuss this in, in detail here. I, I report here, I, I just want to report the, the results uh, published by the Planck Collaboration, which um, analyzed CMB data and showing, I mean, uh, showing also the combination with uh, barium acoustic oscillations. And so it turns out that these cosmological observables are sensitive to the sum of the neutrino masses. And the limits obtained here are uh, of the order. I mean, if we combine CMB and baryon acoustic oscillations, it's 0 0.12 electron volt uh, constraint on the sum of neutrino masses. Now, uh, let me just uh, uh, parameterize the sum of the neutrino masses uh, in terms, I mean, we know the mass, the mass square differences we know two of the mass square differences from neutrino oscillations. So we can parameterize the sum of the neutrino masses by uh, those two mass splittings, which are essentially measured, and the lightest neutrino mass. So we can choose the lightest neutrino mass uh, as the free parameter, and then the, the sum of the neutrino masses is fixed because we know the mass splitting from oscillations. And this is what I, I show here, the sum of the neutrino mass as a function of the lightest neutrino mass. And depending on the mass ordering, the blue curve is for inverted ordering and the normal ordering, it's clear that there is a minimal value for the sum. If the lightest neutrino mass is zero, we, we still have uh, the mass square differences measured by oscillations. And so there is a minimum value for the sum of the neutrino mass, which is fixed by oscillation experiment, is essentially fixed with a very small uncertainty. And those are the values. So these are roughly uh, 60 milli electron volt or, or 100 milli electron volt for normal and inverted ordering. And actually, we are seeing that the current limit, the, the limit I mentioned in the previous slide of 0 0.12 electron volt is already close to the minimal value of predicted for inverted ordering. So this is very exciting you know, because this means actually by a, a small improvement of the cosmological sensitivity, we should really start seeing a positive effect. And I've shown here some predictions which we should expect uh, in the not so far future, in particular from the Euclid uh, satellite uh, large scale structure measurement in, up in the next couple of years, 
we should have a significant improvement here and we expect actually to see uh, to see a positive signal for neutrino mass. Now this is very exciting because we are we have kind of a uh, guaranteed signal if uh, everything is uh, as, as predicted in the standard scenario. And uh, in particular, this may allow us to uh, eventually exclude uh, inverted ordering. Now the, the idea is the following, if cosmology become sensitive enough such that we we can distinguish between 60 milli electron volt and 100 milli electron volt then we will be able to exclude the value from inverted ordering and at that, po that point cosmology could really tell us about um, about the mass ordering now as I, so this is the the current status in, in, in the present data i think there is no way that we can make a meaningful statement between the two orderings. But once we're starting to be sensitive at, at that level, that we, we have a precision, which is better than the difference between 60 and 100, then we may be able to, to exclude uh, the invert ordering. And actually this may be the case in the not so far future. Okay, uh, let me mention now the beta decay measurement. So this is related to the phase space factor of the beta decay endpoint. You observe the electron spectrum from beta decay and you zoom in here at the very final part uh, of the spectrum, the high energy part. And um, uh, zooming in here means really at the level of 10 to the minus 13. So this is really a tiny fraction of the full spectrum. And then you may be able to see here uh, the, uh, the effect of a finite mass. And here you are sensitive of an inco incoherent sum of the mass states weighted by the mixing with the, with the electron state. So this is the combination, uh, effective combination we can test with those experiments. And uh, this is done uh, by my colleagues here in, in Karlsruhe, the Katrin experiment. Uh, have uh, released their, their first first results about one year ago. This was the, the, the first uh, data based only on three weeks of data, which was released uh, last year. And uh, this is the beautiful spectrum which they measured. Uh, let me just point out that here the error bars are inflated by a factor of 50. Otherwise, we would not see the error bars. So this is really an incredibly precise measurement of the spectrum, which allows us to, to make a statement about neutrino mass. And this is the official result, which is at the level of one electron volt uh, constraining the, the neutrino mass. What is, what is shown here, again, we can parameterize this effective parameter, again, as a function of the lightest neutrino mass. And this is the, the, the present limit from Katrin, which constrains here the degenerate uh, regime. And this is what we would expect uh, in the final sensitivity of Katrin. And actually, as I mentioned, this first result is just a few weeks of data. And uh, there is now already lots of more data available. And we can expect updated results uh, very soon, pushing down here the sensitivity uh, by country. Now, the, the third possibility is neutrino less double beta decay. This is this uh, uh, decay of a nucleus where the charge number changes by two units with the emission of, of two electrons. Now here, the neutrino is an internal, internal line of this diagram. So we have here the coherent sum over the, the mass states and uh, well, uh, uh, so actually you are, you are sensitive of this particular combination of mixing matrix elements and, and the masses. The important thing is here, it's really U square, not the modulus square. So this combination here is actually sensitive to, to phases entering here in the, in the complex mixing. And this, uh, observable is sensitive to the Majorana phases, these additional 
complex phases which are, do not show up in, in neutrino oscillations because we are seeing here this coherent sum of the, of the, of the Majorana masses. So again, we can, we can uh, use the lightest neutrino mass as a free parameter and predict here this effective uh, observable by using the knowledge which we have from the oscillation parameters. Now those predictions here are these broad bands because of the effect of the Majorana phases. We're seeing these interference effects. And so the, the Majorana phases are of course unknown. And so we have these, these broad bands for normal and, and inverted ordering. And uh, what we are, there are several experiments exploring here this parameter space. And I've, I've drawn here the, the leading limits coming from a couple of experiments using different isotopes to search for this, uh, for this uh, decay. And so also those limits are bands because they, they are affected by nuclear matrix elements. There is some nuclear physics entering here, which is uh, uh, uncertain. And so the, also the limits are here bands coming from the nuclear matrix elements. And uh, what I want to point out here also, the current generation of experiments is in a very interesting region close to this kind of predicted range for inverted ordering. So it's, it's clear that for those experiments, it's a very important information whether neutrino ordering is normal or inverted, because in the case of inverted ordering, there is this uh, predicted range, which is a kind of target region for the next generation of experiment exploring this parameter space. Uh, here in the right panel, I show the correlation between the, the effective parameter in beta decay and the, the sum of neutrino masses from cosmology. This is the current limit. And also we are seeing here a nice complementarity between uh, beta, double beta decay and cosmological observables, exploring here this uh, very interesting range of the um, uh, inverted mass ordering. Now, of course, the, the very important uh, uh, statement which I want to emphasize is that neutrino less double beta decay actually measures lepton number violation. So it's, as, I, as I pointed out in the beginning, this it is a, is a definite prediction of this effective approach of the Weinberg operator that lepton number should be violated. And so this is a generic prediction of this operator that uh, uh, neutrino double beta decay should see lepton number violation by two, two units uh, if this effective description makes sense. And so the observation of a signal in neutrino less double beta decay would really prove that lepton number is, is violated by, by two units, which implies that uh, uh, what, if lepton number is no longer a good symmetry of the Lagrangian, it, imply, it implies that uh, uh, Majorana mass will be induced uh, at some level. So I think this is a very fundamental measurement uh, if we want to make progress to, to address those uh, fundamental questions. Okay, so, uh, so let me just uh, emphasize this again. So in order to really address those questions, we would definitely need some sign of new physics uh, related to the, uh, just beyond the pure presence of, of the mass term. And uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, unfortunately, we have very little guidance from theory. There is this huge range of scales where uh, this uh, new physics can sit. And so also here, let me take the phenomenological approach and uh, just search for any sign beyond the standard three flavor paradigm without any theoretical pre-justice. So, then a, a possible approach is to, to, to look for anomalies, which may be showing some inconsistency with the three flavor paradigm. And for the rest uh, of the time, I want to discuss uh, two such possible 
anomalies. The first one uh, is, a, is a slight tension between solar neutrino data and Kamland reactor experiment, which uh, may indicate the presence of some non-standard uh, neutrino interactions. And the second one are these uh, uh, infamous short baseline anomalies, which may point to sterile neutrinos. So let me start with the uh, solar neutrino, solar Kamlan tension. So this was a kind of a long-standing tension, which uh, was present for several years between the determination of the, the small delta m squared, delta m squared 2, 1, coming from the Kamlan reactor experiment and from solar neutrino uh, experiments. And uh, so what is shown here is the spectrum of solar neutrinos as a function of the neutrino energy. And uh, um, actually the, uh, the blue curve is, is the prediction which you would expect from the determination of the delta m square coming from the Kamlan reactor experiment. And you're seeing that there is some tension between this prediction and the solar neutrino data, in particular the green data points uh, shown here, which is the super Kamikande uh, spectral measurements, which somehow uh, seem somewhat in tension with this upturn of the spectrum and the solar data would be more in preference with the red curve. And there is this, there was this tension between those values. Uh, an additional effect is coming from the day-night effect in solar neutrinos. Now, as a matter of fact, uh, also at the neutrino conference in June this year, there was an update from Super Kamekande solar neutrino data. And it, it turns out that this tension is now completely gone. There was an update of the solar, solar neutrino spectrum. You're seeing the blue data points shifted upwards and so they are more consistent with the upturn here. And also the day-night observation uh, changed with the new data. And so this is the tension is illustrated here. We are seeing in green is the determination coming from the Kamland experiment. And in orange was the, the pre uh, the pre 20 determination. And there was here this tension. Whereas now with the latest uh, new update, then the new results are here, the red or the, or the black dash curve. And you're seeing there, you see they are consistent within one sigma. So this tension is completely gone. And there now these data are perfectly compatible uh, statistically. Now, this has some implications because as I mentioned, the, this tension may be a possible hint for non-standard neutrino interactions. So what do I mean here? Uh, we can parameterize the interaction of neutrinos with uh, standard, other standard model fermion, fermions with uh, these usual chief Fermi interactions, but there could be some new type of interactions beyond the standard model. And uh, conventionally, these are parameterized by these epsilon parameters, which are is the strength of these four Fermi interactions relative to, to weak interactions. So this is G Fermi. So we are using these epsilon parameters to parameterize a new interactions relative to, uh, to G Fermi. And we can uh, look for these exotic interactions in neutrino data. And actually, I'm reporting here the result of this global analysis performed by, by those authors here. I'm quoting the results from, from that paper. And uh, this is the situation uh, before the Neutrino 20 conference. And OK, what is shown here, I mean, without going into the details here, so this is the relative chi-square between uh, no non-standard interactions. So this is a standard model. Standard model is here, is, is 0. And uh, if if your chi-square is below zero, this means that actually the non-standard effects uh, are preferred. You, you get, a, get a better fit. And actually, before the neutrino conference, there was some hint. Well, I mean, there are some units in chi-square, actually 10 units in chi-square in the, in the best case, 
a preference, showing a preference for these uh, new interactions. And this was largely driven by this tension between solar and Kamaland experiment. Now this is the post neutrino case and essentially this hint is uh, disappeared. This, we are now at only something like three units in chi-square. Of course, the fit is better because you have much more parameters. So this is clear, clearly that your fit, your chi-square will be lower, but this is definitely not significant given that you have at, uh, seven new parameters if I did the counting correct. And so this is by no means significant and essentially uh, the, this hint disappeared uh, now with, with the new data. But let me point out one interesting result here, which are these dashed lines. So this is the, the so-called dark LMA solution. And uh, actually what these dash curves show are showing that this so-called dark LMA solution gives a, an equally good fit as the standard model, even slightly better. Now, what is this dark LMA? Actually, this is a, a solution which uh, has a, a value of the solar mixing angle, which is larger than 45 degrees. That's why it's called uh, dark LMA. Whereas in the standard model, this mixing angle is lower than 45 degrees with very high significance. So, but this uh, non solution or non standard interactions uh, allow for that mixing angle. And actually, it implies the opposite mass ordering. So, this, this solution implies that there is a degeneracy in the mass ordering. So, instead of only those two patterns which we have in the standard model, if we allow for those non standard interactions, we have also those possibilities where you essentially flip also the ordering of the, of the small masses. And this is consistent with the data, which is shown here, you know, that this, this solution is perfectly consistent. And this is very interesting because actually this requires non-standard interactions of the same order as weak interactions. It implies a one, an order one modification of the mixing pattern which is really remarkable that uh, with all these huge high precision measurements, we, we still have this order one modification of the mi mixing pattern. Or moreover, it, because of this degeneracy, it makes it impossible to determine the mass ordering by oscillation experiments. So this is I uh, find quite remarkable that even in uh, this, uh, let's say some people uh, talking about we are entering the precision era, I think this example is, is still the, maybe the only example I'm aware of where we can have an order one perturbation of the neutrino sector. Okay, so finally, let's briefly mention also those uh, sterile neutrinos, possible hints for sterile neutrinos. Also here, there are long-standing anomalies, the reactor anomaly, gallium anomaly, and the LSND and mini bone anomalies, which uh, may point to the existence of, of sterile neutrinos at the electron mass. So we would, would, would have a fourth, fourth neutrino state, which is mostly sterile, and which is separated from the other two by a mass splitting of order electron, electron volt. So let me briefly comment on, on the status of, of, of those hints. Let me start with the reactor anomaly, which is an electron disappearance indication. And so there is the original reactor anomaly, which is the tension between the, the predicted number of neutrinos coming from nuclear reactors and the observed the experimental measurements. So this is the, uh, the original uh, reactor anomaly was a, a, a total rate effect so that uh, actually the, the um, observed neutrino rates were too low compared to the predicted. And um, uh, this could be explained by electron disappearance. So if you have these additional sterile neutrinos, you could explain the, the reduced rate at nuclear reactors. And actually, the, the, the problem here is that this is based on the, these theoretical calculations, nuclear physics calculations, which are dominated by systematic and theoretical uncertainties. 
And so there have been some recent updates and I'm, I'm reporting here this, uh, this compilation from that paper, uh, which compared the recent uh, calculations of those rates and uh, to these original calculations. And it seems actually that the, the picture which is emerging is, is unclear. You know? So they, they, this depending on which uh, theoretical calculations are used, the significance either disappears below one sigma level or, or it's, it's close to three sigma. And so uh, I think the, the main conclusion here is that this is uh, still not settled, that the theoretical calculations, there is no agreement in the community yet. And uh, this the statement here is systematics dominated and theoretical uncertainties, which are very difficult uh, to evaluate. And so I think this situation is unclear at the moment. Now, there is in recent years, a second type of reactor anomaly, which is related to spectral distortions. So this is this lower part here. So let me focus on these spectral distortions. So this is coming just from uh, shape measurements. And then the new modern experiments can measure very precisely measure the spectral shape of the reactor flux. And by comparing spectral measurements at different baselines, we can make statements which are completely independent of those theoretical predictions. And so here is the status of about two years ago. We, we made an analysis here and we found the uh, kind of a three sigma indication for, for uh, these uh, sterile neutrinos just based on spectral uh, distortions without any theoretical uh, assumption here. Now, let me give you an update what happened in the, in the last two years. Actually, there is lots of experimental activity. There is many reactor experiments uh, coming online and uh, releasing data. Here are a few examples I mentioned here. I mean, DAMS, Neutrino 4, Stereo, Prospect, NEOS, uh, which all show these relative measurements. And actually, there are a number of hints appearing at the level of between two and three sigma. Seem, we seem to see some, some preference for spectral distortion. Now, there are two uh, important questions. The first one, is there uh, a consistent hint emerging? So are all those hints kind of uh, coherently adding up or are these just uh, statistical fluctuations? And then the second question is how to evaluate the, the statistical significance of, uh, of, those, uh, of those hints. Now, this is now preliminary results. We are just uh, working on this uh, global analysis of these uh, new reactor experiments. I'm showing here some preliminary results showing uh, different uh, chi-square contours at different levels. Uh, and okay, these are very busy plots and you're seeing here many uh, contours and many ellipses in this, in this plot. So let me just give you the, the main message here. So we are seeing these various hints, these, these wiggles and islands here are manifestations of those hints, which I mentioned in the previous slide. It turns out, I mean, even if you stare for some time on those wiggles, there is no consistent picture emerging. So the problem is that sometimes they overlap and sometimes they don't. And so it seems that there is no clear hint emerging. There is the global chi-square shows some preference at the level of a delta chi-square of order 10. But uh, let's say by I, there is not a beautiful minimum and it's a messy situation. And I would say, in my opinion, there is not really a clear uh, picture emerging yet. Now, the second question is, I'm quoting here a delta chi-square of 9.9. .9. Now, of course, you may ask, what is the statistical significance of that? And actually, this is a very non-trivial question, as we pointed out recently in that paper, actually that, um, this is a very non-trivial statistical problem. Actually, it can be formulated, this sterile neutrino search can be formulated as a, 
as fitting some noise with uh, an, an oscillatory signal with an arbitrary amplitude. So in some sense, this would be the delta m square and this would be the mixing angle, but mathematically it can be shown that in some approximation, this is equivalent to fitting white noise with a cosine function with some amplitude. And so it turns out that this is a non-Gaussian problem that it's just, it's just very likely that if this is white noise that you will find uh, some frequency which fits white noise better than, 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 than no frequency. Now, and we did here some statistical study and I mean, without going in detail, what we show here is you now even if we simulate data with no oscillations, the best fit turns out to be, uh, you find a positive value for the mixing angle and the mass square difference. So statistically, this estimator is biased. You always find the best fit point and the distribution is not centered around zero. And actually the distribution here is quite non-Gaussian. And so, I mean, all I want to say is that it's tricky. You cannot just go here and do the, the usual Gaussian chi-square and you, you really have to run a Monte Carlo. And typically this would not correspond to three sigma but the significance is actually lower than, uh, than three sigma. Okay, final comment. Uh, sorry, I, if I have two minutes, do I have still two minutes? I make final comment on the... Yes, go on, Thomas. Okay, I'll, I'll try to finish in two minutes and just comment on the LSMD and uh, Minibone study, which is a mu to electron appearance uh, hint which is there, and this is actually quite significant. It's uh, 3.8 or be above for sigma. And uh, while this was interpreted in terms of uh, sterile neutrino oscillations, so the, the, the short message is that uh, this is in strong tension with disappearance measurement. So there is this unique prediction that if you want to explain those experiments with oscillations, uh, you, you have a prediction for electron appearance and for muon appearance, and, but, and we have not seen any signal in muon disappearance. So this is the predicted strength for the muon disappearance and the black curve is the upper bound and there is this strong tension here. And uh, the, the, the chances to explain this, the p-value to that those data are consistent is really small. It's less than 10 to the minus six. And uh, this is essentially excluded to explain this by, by sterile neutrino oscillations. And okay, we did some study here. This is a very robust result. And uh, it seems essentially excluded to explain this by sterile neutrino oscillations. And okay, of course, then the question is, can this be some other new physics? And uh, of course, there are many ideas and uh, this includes really uh, very exotic stuff. And as a matter of fact, it's really uh, hard and actually most of those ideas are not viable and are excluded by, by some, some data. Now, I have now no time left, but let me just mention uh, one recent uh, activity because there, there was quite some uh, activity recently in trying to explain those effects by decaying sterile neutrinos. So you postulate a, a heavy sterile neutrino, heavy meaning between KV to MeV range, and then you postulate some mechanism to produce those states and then they would decay. And this could give you a possible signal uh, to uh, trying to explain mini boom and, and uh, LSMD. So yeah, let me skip this. I think this is quite exciting. It could be exciting new physics. There is rich phenomenology. And I think we should uh, keep an open mind and really trying to look for non-standard signatures uh, because all those scenarios really predict signatures in existing experiments or in near future upcoming experiments and which may look different than sterile neutrino oscillations. So this is, uh, we should be open-minded and look
for all kinds of exotic signatures, which uh, may be some manifestations of interest in new physics. Okay, so let me let me summarize. So I have uh, discussed a number of hints, and let me give you this table of all the hints which I mentioned because maybe you lost track of all the hints. So I started discussing hints for CP violation, which completely disappeared. Now current data is consistent with CP conservation at one sigma level. The hint for normal mass ordering decreased uh, quite a bit with the recent data. It's now at the level of two sigma, going down from three sigma to two sigma. Hint for non-standard interactions disappeared completely. Reactor rate anomaly is a confusing situation uh, subject to theoretical uncertainties. Reactor shape anomaly, no clear hint actually is emerging. I didn't mention the gallium anomaly, but also this significant uh, decreased quite a bit with the recent uh, calculations. The LSD minibone hints, they are very robust statistically, but there are no uh, clear interpretation is emerging. So it seems uh, a bit disappointing that all those hints are, are kind of uh, fading away. Now let me try to close with a, with a positive uh, statement. Of course, neutrino mass itself is a very robust hint for new physics. And I think we should really try to explore that hint, which is extremely robust. Now, unfortunately, we have uh, no idea, no clear idea at which kind of new physics and at which energy scale, but I think we should take that as an opportunity. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry for taking too long. Okay, so thank you very much, Thomas, for this very nice talk and very comprehensive review of the status of uh, neutrino physics. So are there questions? I have a very simple question. Okay. So is there any <clears throat> preference for Majorana versus Dirac neutrino other than the elegance of the CISO mechanism at the moment, either theoretical or experimental? Uh, okay, I think, so experimental, there is no, no hint yet. I mean, no preference whatsoever. I mean, experimentally, we, we, we have no, uh, no indication yet. I mean, of course, there are theoretical pre-justice why many theorists would argue for, for Majorana uh, mass term. But uh, I think other than these theoretical arguments, I think we have no, no clear indication. But I think uh, prospects are promising. And I think that the, really the unique opportunity is neutrino less double beta decay, which- but only, only if, the, if nature is generous and the neutrino is uh, su sufficiently heavy, right? Yes, yeah. So, well, I mean, I've- uh, If it's a milli electron volt, it would never be found. Uh, oh, there is some- Okay, sorry, now there seems a problem. Yeah, yeah, I agree. No, we, we have to be lucky in neutrino less double beta decay. Uh, this is the this is the situation. No current current experiments are still here in this uh, degenerate regime, and it depends where we are. And then uh, we might be able to answer this question. But I agree. I think this is a very fundamental question. And cosmology cannot give us any hint because uh, Dirac has uh, twice the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, no, the, the, the cosmological observables which I discussed cannot distinguish between Dirac and, and, and Majorana. I mean, okay, there is this very remote idea if we might be able to measure directly the cosmic neutrino background. If you have a direct measurement of cosmic neutrino background, there in principle, there is a factor of two difference between Dirac mm -hmm. and Majorana. But I think this is so remote and so so futuristic that I, then I think we would know it before from neutrino less double beta decay. Mm -hmm. So I think cosmology is very hard to distinguish Majorana and uh, Dirac case. Okay, so I see there is a question from Enrique Fernandez. Enrique? 
Hi, Thomas. Thank you for the talk. So I, I was studying for a while at, at the plot with the different prediction for the uh, normal versus inverted order in, in the atmospheric uh, sample of super cameo candle. This very small difference between the two and the data. Do you understand where four points in chi-square can come from? <laughs> no, the answer is no. <laughs> no, I think, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, you can stare on this plot and uh, just from those data, you don't see four units in chi-square. I mean, I, I agree completely that if you look at those error bars and how, how tiny the difference is, uh, it's not clear where this unit, where this result comes from. Now, of course, Super K is not just using those data. You know, it's a very complicated analysis and they have hundreds of things. Uh, and uh, the, these four units emerge from a very sophisticated kit involving hundreds of things and many pools, many systematic errors. And then if you add up all these complicated tests, you end up with four units of tests. And I think this is part of the problem why it's not reproducible because you cannot really point to a given set of data points which really lead to the effect. It comes really about from a very subtle interplay of a complicated analysis. And this makes it so difficult to reproduce this effect. Even if, even if you have a finer beginning, and, and I mean, the physics is the physics and the difference between the prediction between normal and inverted, it's so small. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, I agree completely. But I think precisely this is the reason why it's so difficult to reproduce this result. Okay. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So, is there any other question? Uh, yes, Ivan. Uh, hi, Thomas. Uh, um, well, nice talk. Uh, one question regarding the T2K experiment. I mean, why, for example, the CC1 pion uh, lines or band does not match with the with the one sigma rio? Uh. Yeah, you're referring to this, uh, this yeah, panel yeah. here. I mean, okay, this is one sigma. No? So if you go to 1.5 sigma, things agree. So I think you see also the number of events is, is, is not so high. I think we are here just seeing Poisson statistics. And so, I think this is a statistical fluctuations, which is to be expected. You, know, you expect that uh, data fluctuate at the level of one sigma. Now, I mean, I agree that the fluctuation was in the right direction in the sense that this, of course, leads to contributes to this preference, which we are seeing in T2K. Uh, but otherwise, I would not overinterpret this result, in my opinion, this is consistent within statistical fluctuations. And I think this is, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, for some statistics which we are seeing here. But I mean, yes, you're right that these fluctuations is, is in the right direction and contributes to this uh, indication we are seeing here. And actually uh, it went down with the recent data. I mean, this, uh, if you call it tension, but this hint was slightly larger in the pre uh, Neutrino 20 data set. And also this became more consistent uh, with the new data. And this contributed actually here to, to this shift, uh, shift also for T2K, that also T2K by itself became now more consistent with uh, CP conservation. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we have we are now running out of time. So let's thank Thomas, and I uh, and uh, I leave the word to Swen. We will host uh, the next talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.